All right, we are here. Welcome to the Black Swan Group's Fireside on Tips to How to Achieve Tactical Empathy. I am Chris Voss, CEO and founder of the Black Swan Group. Prior to 2008, I was the lead hostage negotiator, with well, lead international kidnapping negotiator for the FBI. And I handled, you know, kidnappings globally around the world, domestically, internationally, domestic sieges, international kidnappings. I have, with the help of my son, Brandon Voss, we took the hostage negotiation tools, transferred our skills into the business section sector, uh, started teaching at Georgetown University, Harvard University, and USC, University of Southern California, for all you Southeasterners that think that's uh, University of South Carolina. And then we published in 2016, Never Split the Difference, Negotiating as If Your Life Depended on It. Wall Street Journal bestseller, selling globally. Today we teach individuals and companies how to negotiate with emotional intelligence, tactical empathy from everything in their lives, from getting a cup of coffee at Starbucks to getting a hotel suite upgrade, free upgrade on a hotel suite. So with that, I have one of my my co-hosts, my, my co-pilots, Shay. Shay, I think you got a couple of things you want to add at this point. Yes, as everybody fills in, welcome to um, today's fireside chat. Um, I am your moderator, along with Kayla of the Black Swan Group. And just as Chris said, today's topic is on tips on how to achieve tactical empathy. Um, so if any time during our conversation you would like to ask Chris a question, um, feel free to send a message via the chat and we'll invite you to come up on the stage. Um, and for the folks who are tuning in uh, worldwide via desktop, uh, be sure to request access to the Fireside app through the page that you're currently on so you can join us and interact in future conversations. Um, and also, this is very important. Um, be sure to follow Chris and all of our Black Swan Group instructors so you receive exclusive alerts for future Fireside chats that you can RSVP to be a part of. And share this stuff out while it's going on. If uh, if we're saying stuff that you like, uh, we'd love it if you if you shared it across your platforms. Let the world know. For example, I see that Troy Jackson is in the house, and he was with us yesterday when uh, we had Sandy's session going, and he threw some brilliant stuff out that I really enjoyed, and I tweeted out some of his uh, some of his comments. So that's the cool thing about the people that get involved with us and, and learn tactical empathy and that we coach and we train um, some smart folks out there uh, and get, get a kick out of talking to you and hearing your thoughts too and your questions. Do we want to dive right in? Uh, Shay, you want me to tee off on, on our first sort of prep question or do we have somebody clamoring for our attention right off the bat? Let me see. Nobody as of yet. So, guys, definitely put questions into the chat for Chris. Um, but we can start with our first question. Chris, can you explain what tactical empathy is and why it's crucial to not only use in negotiations, but everyday conversations to uncover black swans? Yeah, you know, and, and, and I want to dive in a little bit on both of these words uh, because some of the stuff that I've put out on uh, Instagram recently um, you know people react to both tactical and empathy in different ways they react to tactical some people react as if it's a negative thing and some people react to empathy as if it's you know positive thing in terms of sympathy compassion agreement and, and both are really actually neutral words uh, like a knife is a neutral tool in one person's hand. It's an instrument of death in a surgeon's hand. It's an instrument of life. It's a tool. Any given tool uh, is not in and of itself either good or bad. 
Uh, it can lead to very good things or even occasionally bad things. Now, empathy is a crazy word. My understanding in the etymology, those of you that are wordsmiths I always get confused between etymology and entomology. I think etymology is origin and entomology is a study of insects. Easy to get those two confused, but the origin of empathy is that it was originally an interpretation from a German word about feeling art. Um, and it's really about trying to get and understand, just develop an understanding of the feelings that are being projected by the other side, the feelings and perspectives. So really a neutral thing. Like you might react to a work of art and it might touch you, but you're trying to figure out what feelings are coming off of it. And then as we move forward through time, you know, empathy gets, uh, you know, uh, uh, interpreted in different ways along the way. But what I learned it mostly from was a guy named Carl Rogers, American psychologist that really, again, used empathy just to hear people out, find out where they're coming from. And Rogers used a phrase, if you could summarize their thoughts and feelings completely, not your thoughts and feelings, but their thoughts and feelings completely. And not whether or not you agree or whether or not you disagree, but just what's coming off of them, their attitude. And that was kind of what I learned about empathy from suicide hotline days back in the 19 blah, 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 ever before the Internet, even before cell phones. And then I ran across Bob Manukin's book, uh, you know, in the early part of this century, Beyond Winning. And Bob Manukin is a chair, uh, was a chair of on negotiation in charge of the program on negotiation at Harvard. And his book, Beyond Winning, I highly recommend chapter two in that book, best, best chapter on empathy I've ever read. And what we tell everybody that's a black swan, read and absorb and into your DNA this chapter. Because Manukin said empathy is not agreement. It's not even necessarily liking the other side. You draw this fine line with empathy, then it becomes a completely limitless skill, unlimited skill. It requires no common ground. It requires no agreement. You know, empathy is about the transmission of information. Stephen Kotler would say that. Kotler is the author of a number of books on flow. Interesting cat. One of the more interesting dudes I've ever met. But it's about the transmission of information. Compassion is a reaction to that information. Sympathy is a reaction to that information. Empathy is a compassionate thing to do, but it's not necessarily compassion. So it's just about getting where the other side is coming from so fully and so completely that they say that's right. That's what we talk about. The black swan method is about triggering that's right moments from the other side. Now, what good does that do you? This is getting a good five star that's right out of somebody is equivalent of sprinkling fairy dust on them and changing their mind because a good solid that's right triggers oxytocin. Oxytocin is the bonding drug. Oxytocin is what's behind all these mystical experiences in the past such as the Stockholm Syndrome. If you uh, ever heard of the Stockholm Syndrome, came from a, uh, a siege in a bank in Stockholm, Sweden, like in the 1970s, and the hostages that came out all refused to testify against their captors. And they were, the world was shocked that the hostages had so bonded to their captors. And in fact... One of the reasons why it's called the Stockholm Syndrome instead of Brooklyn Syndrome, Brooklyn, as in the movie Dog Day Afternoon, was during the captivity, during the siege, there were indicators that some of the female hostages actually had sex with their captors. And the world was going like, what in the world is going on? But the oxytocin is the bonding drug. Oxytocin is what mothers feel when their children are born and they are bonded to the 
child. Oxytocin is this crazy one-way drug because when a newborn baby is born, you know, over the year it attaches to the mother or the parent by being held, by being nurtured. But the mother, the instant, and the father, because I bonded to my son the moment he was born, you know, we lay eyes on our children and we're done. I can remember when I laid eyes on my son, Brandon Voss, unofficial co-author of Never Split the Difference. Like, I was done the moment I saw him. That was oxytocin. Now, on his end, you know, he a little kid, fresh in the world, blinking, looking at me. And he's like, you know, that guy looks kind of interesting. He's got kind of a dopey look on his face. He looks like he might be nice. But the point is, oxytocin is this one-way bonding. What do you do when you get a that's right out of somebody in a negotiation? They bond with you. They bond with you in a very big way. And this oxytocin bond is massive. And that's what empathy is about, triggering an oxytocin bond from the other side to you. Now, we threw the word tactical in, again, as a neutral term. Why did we throw that in to make empathy much more of a neutral word, a neutral tool that anybody can use? I had to use it as a hostage negotiator. You guys have me out there negotiating against Al Qaeda. Do you want me to be sympathy with Al Qaeda in order to save your life? No, you want me to get the dude from Al Qaeda to bond with me so I can get him to do what I want. And it's a mercenary's tool. And tactical is when we begin to discover neuroscience and we find out about things like oxytocin. We find out about things about dopamine, chemical reactions. It's a hard science. Neuroscience is a hard science. Psychology is a soft science. You know, and as a hostage negotiator or even a business negotiator, you find limited use for psychology. But neuroscience is really hard stuff. For example... The neuroscience experiment has been done over and over and over again, triggering them on a negative emotion in somebody's brain. Neuroscience has mapped out what we call the limbic system in your brain. And most people have heard of something called the amygdala. Everybody, you know, people have heard the amygdala hijack. Well, the amygdala is this almond sized organ in the center of your brain that you're emotional, it's like the command post, if you will, for your emotions as they run through your brain. Now, neuroscientists have mapped the amygdala and know that 75% of the real estate in the amygdala is dedicated to negative thoughts. 75% to negative thoughts. Half, one entire half, and then 25% of the other half, 75% of the real estate. So they put people in fMRIs. Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging Device. So they can watch the electricity go through a person's brain. And then they showed them a picture. And the picture was designed to induce negative thoughts. And that might be a puppy in the rain. You know, who knows? A baby seal on a beach. A little old lady that was homeless. But whatever. It was pictures that would induce negative thoughts. They show them the picture and they watch the 75% of the amygdala that's negative, light up. See the electrical activity go through it. And then they simply say, what are you feeling? Labeling, the Black Swan Methods tool of labeling. And they have the person self-label, which is a side note. This means you can negotiate with yourself with this method. And each time the person labeled the negative emotion, each time, not half the time, Every time, the electrical activity in the negative part of the amygdala diminished. Every single time. Labeling works every single time. Now, the critical aspect of this tactical application of this neuroscience knowledge to empathy is the degree of impact wasn't always the same. Maybe it diminished it a little bit. Maybe it diminished it a lot. And so when we're teaching you the black swan method and we have you employ something called the accusations audit, which is a series of 
calling out the negatives in advance, the tactical application of emotional intelligence. If the amygdala is 75% negative, you need to lead by deactivating the negatives every time. Well, when don't you deactivate the negatives? It works only with human beings who are alive. Lead by deactivating the negatives. We tell people to do a negative assessment, the accusations audit, call them out in advance. And we say to them, all right, so you did your negative labels, the series of labels, and they stared at you. What does that mean? And most people will say like, ah, it didn't work. Ah, I'm on the wrong track. No. If you get no reaction from the other side to the labeling of a negative, that means it worked. You just need more. You're on track. You've just got more to go through. So, Shay, you asked me, what is tactical empathy? It's us taking empathy as a demonstration of understanding and adding in what we know to be true from neuroscience to accelerate the process so you get your deals faster. How much faster do you get your deals? The Black Swan Group was in an important conversation two weeks ago. We used tactical empathy We scheduled the call for 60 minutes. We were done in 17. We were prepared for it to take 60 minutes to get to where we wanted to go, and we got there in 17 minutes. That's how it accelerates things. That's how you put time back in your life. That's how you give yourself more time to enjoy life that much more. And in this negotiation, when we were done, everybody was in a good mood. And that's what you want to strive for. That is exactly correct. Just being able to spark, what was it? The What was the chem, brain chemical that you said? Oxytocin? Oxytocin. Oxytocin. That not is- to be confused with Oxycontin. <laughs> I'm not dealing Oxycontin <laughs> here. I'm an I'm a oxytocin dealer. Just being able to establish a trust-based influence off of tactical empathy. And as you said, you completed the deal or completed the conversation within, (laughs) you know, several minutes, 17 minutes. It's just, that's amazing. So we have a question from Jigar. Jigar, would you unmute yourself? Hi there. Uh, um, Thank you for uh, having me up and uh, giving me the opportunity to ask uh, the, the amazing, legendary Chris Voss a question. Um, Chris, I've been following you for quite some time now, and I, I've watched the master class, uh, the book, and of course, uh, every ra- uh, YouTube rabbit hole I can uh, find you in. Um, and uh, so my question is, you know, one of the things I, I wonder is, uh, you know, you are so generous with your information your your knowledge and do you ever wonder what happens when you know more people know about your method and you know a black swan meets a black swan and how do they negotiate <laughs> how do they how do you negotiate with a black swan like you know what do you what do you do when you're in a negotiation with with your son um or, or someone who knows all your tools um and then the second part uh is uh how do you see the method evolving uh as more people come to uh know of it yeah you know i I love both those questions that's really cool and it's almost it's almost a joke like right like you know three black swans walk into a bar and and who pays (laughs) um yeah we negotiate with each other all the time I mean, one of the first things we do, especially when we bring somebody new into the uh, into the organization, um, is we make sure that they're using the skills with each other. We got to get them out of the bad habits. Like the first bad habit is asking questions where somebody's trying to get a yes for an answer. I mean, that's horrible. I mean, that's just bad, bad communication. So we got to get people out of the yes habit, but. You know, tactical empathy is about genuinely understanding the other side. Uh, It's not bad 
depending upon what you're using it for. And we believe in collaboration of black swan groups. So we negotiate with each other all the time. Like Brandon will call me on the phone and if he's got something that's developed a hot button and, you know, he needs to take, uh, he needs to take corrective action with me soon because for whatever reason I'm running down the wrong track. He says, he calls me on the phone and says, you're not going to like this. And, you know, that's a miniature accusations audit before we get started. You know, this is going to make you angry. That you're going to find this highly insulting. You know, he, he'll throw those one of those at me, and I'll appreciate it because I know the effect it has on me. You know, I'll imagine something really bad, and then whatever he talks about is going to be a relief, and we can navigate it really quickly. So we use these we use this stuff with each other all the time. So the issue really isn't if somebody's black swan trained; it's what are they trying to do with it. And the more in the black swan method you are, then the faster you are at recognizing the motivation of the other side. And a lot of you are also asked, this plays into the other question you're asking me is how is this evolving? It's evolved massively since we first started it. And one of them is a recognition of the person on the other side. Because just because you can make the deal doesn't mean you want to. And we're spending a lot of time on a concept that we refer to as proof of life. Is there a deal there at all? Is it a deal with you? And even if the deal is there with you, do you want to deal with them? We borrowed a phrase uh, from a guy, good friend, runs an organization called Genius Network. His name is Joe Polish. What do we borrow from Joe Polish? He talks about customers, counterparts, people that are both that are half or elf. What's half? Hard, annoying, lame, and frustrating. And the L and half could actually be lucrative. Joe says somebody could be hard, annoying, lucrative, and frustrating. And you don't want to deal with those people. What's an elf? Joe says elf is easy, lucrative, and fun. So some of what we're evolving to is identifying halves up front because money from them is blood money. It sucks the life out of you. It makes you unhappy. And we, even in the people that call our business development team, working very seriously on what our half profiles look like. And Davy Johnson who run, runs Biz, Biz Dev. She uses tactical empathy. And when somebody calls in, that's a half client, even if they're offering us a lot of money, I encourage her to not make that deal because they're going to be painful every step of the way. And we're just not interested in them because the half people are not repeat customers and the elf people are. And we use tactical empathy to get a feel really quickly whether or not they're half or elf because everybody that's half keeps us from the elves. Everybody that's hard, annoying, and lame and frustrating is going to be a one-shot interaction. It's going to be difficult and painful, and they're not going to repeat. And the elves are going to be repeat customers, possibly lifelong customers, long-term prosperous relationships. They don't mind paying because they, they're willing to pay for what they get. They don't chisel you on the price. They want you to deliver a great product, and we do. And so that's one of the ways that we're constantly evolving and to tie both of those things together. We love people that negotiate with us using our methods, and we welcome it because we know they're going to be more effective and they're also more likely to be there in the long term. So they could be great long term customers, clients, and friends. Wow, fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, it, it's uh, so great talking to you. Um, that uh, is really helpful. And, and I look forward to see what you guys come out in the, with in the future. And, and I'm, I'm a, I remain a huge fan. Thank you. Thanks, man. Th thanks, for, thanks for being with us on our journey. Thanks, Jigar.
Tim Street, you're up next. What's your question for Chris? Hey, hey, Chris, thanks for coming to Fireside. We're really excited to have you here. Um, yeah, it's cool. Happy to be here. Great. Uh, curious if you um, have been trained in managing and controlling your reaction to your own emotions. Because I imagine when you're talking to people, you're experiencing emotions yourself. You know, like you might be in an argument with a significant other and something you say you wish you didn't say. Right. Um, can you talk about that, that training, what you went through, or, or if you didn't, what, what you've learned along the way? Yes, you know, great question, man. Great question. That's an ongoing challenge. And, you know, I'll throw a little, I'll throw a little commercial out if I can, uh, because I'd be remiss if I didn't let you know what the Black Swan uh, team was doing. You know, we, we've got a course called Caviar, which is all about mindset. And the C in caviar stands for curiosity. Now, this is an ongoing battle for everybody. And I'll refer back to the amygdala, the mysterious amygdala. Because the amygdala, again, like it's 75% negative. So as a human being, when I wake up in the morning and I'm functioning normally, my amygdala is in survival mode, which is 75% negative. You know, you're not, I'm not negative because I grew up, uh, you know, with demanding parents or, you know, because, um, because dad was mean to me or, you know, because of my diet. I'm negative because I'm human. That's how humans are wired. The negative humans, our ancestors, we're descended from people that survive by being basically negative. Survival mode is to be pessimistic. That's why the amygdala is 75% negative. The optimistic caveman didn't survive. The op optimistic caveman walked by the cave and said, you know, last time we came by here, Tim went in and he never came out. And there was a lot of screaming and growling inside and he never came out. But I'm optimistic. I think I can go in there and survive. And that guy doesn't have any ancestors or any descendants. So we wake up in a negative frame of mind. Survival thinking is not success thinking. Success thinking requires hygiene, that daily practice. And I struggle with this myself. You know, I, I got a daily practice of writing down stuff that I'm great, grateful for first thing in the, in the morning. You know, that's that's like oral hygiene. Do I got to? Do I got to do a morning gratitude exercise? Because I did it yesterday. Well, do I got to brush my teeth this morning? Because I brushed them yesterday. Yes, I do. So part of my discovery, and I'm not sure if I was really trained this way externally, but I know in the Black Swan team, we all work on this. We've all got our, our tools. Now, the C in caviar is curiosity. And the crazy thing about curiosity is like it is a mechanism to override negativity automatically. If you're genuinely curious, you can't be angry. Curiosity is a positive frame of mind. So for me personally, I go back and forth to try to keep my mindset positive between curiosity and gratitude. Those are the ones that I try to, the mechanism I use to override the negativity. Several years ago, I'm mentally prepping for negotiation with a then business partner that uh, we knew we didn't trust uh, uh, in that, um, in our interactions, we knew that they, you know, they, this person wasn't completely honest with us. And, it, you know, it was now somebody that I would refer to as half. And we did we did business uh, with this counterpart because the short term benefit was moving the company forward. But I knew that there was going to be a shelf life to it. And since they, they weren't honest um, and prepping for it, I'm in a negative frame of mind because I hate being lied to. You know, one of my currencies is my honesty, and my integrity. I, I You know, I believe in it. I, I got an ex-girlfriend a long time ago that once said to me, you know, you'd rather have your arm ripped off than tell a lie. And I remember thinking, you said that like it was a bad thing, <laughs> like it was an insult. 
So I don't like people that don't that aren't honest with me. And I was in a negative frame of mind. And then I said to myself, you know, the reason we're in this negotiation and because this person just will not let go of making the deal is because we're successful. And I'm actually lucky to be in this conversation at all. I'm lucky to be having this conversation. I'm lucky to be successful. And with that bit of gratitude, it instantly changed my attitude. And I came up with the labels that I needed for the negotiation. So, Tim, I've been giving you a real rambling answer is that um, it's a struggle for everybody because we're human. And the mechanisms that I use to overcome my automatic negativity are gratitude and survival. And I, and I got to repeat them on a regular basis. And I'm far from being perfect in keeping myself out of a negative frame of mind. What about the, the opposite? What about euphoria? What if you're in a state of euphoria where you could also make a mistake by not controlling that reaction to that emotion? Yeah, it's an interesting question, you know, and I'm not sure, you know, euphoria would be a highly positive, Um, you know, euphoria might just be potentially, you know, I probably made a good decision, but I'm not looking sufficiently at all the details. I mean, that's, that's another thing why, you know, the, the default operating mode of the black swan group is uh, you want to go fast, go alone. You want to go far, go as a team. Um, You know, we're a team operation. And I've come to really understand what it means to be a team player because I always thought, yeah, I'm the team leader. I'm a team player. The team needs to get behind me. So if I get euphoric about something, I know if it's going to work to be effective, I got to run it back through my team. Euphoria is only a danger if I'm a diva. And I'm thinking this through as we talk. If I'm truly a team player, And that means I'm serving the team as much or more as the team is serving me. And me being who I am, I have to focus on serving the team versus me, the team serving me. Then euphoria is not a problem at all because I got a strong team game. Yeah, man. Good question. Really thoughtful question. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, we have Krish up on stage. Krish, if you would unmute yourself. Uh, hi, Chris. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, my question, so I, I, asked, I actually asked two questions. I want to know which one that I've been putting. Um, you can ask, I like your second question, if you can ask that one. Okay. Uh, okay, yeah, sure. So my second question is, how do I deal with a party that wants a bribe for a deal to go through? Sure. Yeah. Uh, that's a, I love that question. So my uh-huh. personal, um, uh, opinion is people that are demanding bribes are sick of people who are completely transactional and just using them. And there's so many counterparts that do not give a darn about them. Don't give a crap about them personally. They're like, all right, you're going to treat me like a commodity. It's pay to play. You got to pay extra. If you want to treat me, you want to treat me like a prostitute, then you're going to pay. You know, bribes are for people that are lazy. So if, if I were in a position where somebody was demanding a bribe, then I'm, I'm looking at someone that's never been connected with on a personal level. Uh So I'm actually interested in that challenge. If it's somebody I got to deal with, you know, can Uh I connect with them? Can I, can I trigger an oxytocin moment? Can I give this guy a solid hit of oxytocin? Which is going to say like, all right, so for everybody else, I charge X, but for you, you're getting a family and friends rate. You might even give it for free. I mean, I would look at that person as, um, a, a, a good challenge and if somebody's demanding a bribe from me they're telling me that we haven't connected we really haven't connected they may be charming you know are they a sociopath are they sociopaths react to oxytocin too that's a crazy thing what a lot of people don't understand about empathy is sociopaths lack guilt or feeling bad over their actions or 
maybe they don't care about you, but they still have neurochemicals. They can still get a dose of oxytocin. They still react to dopamine. So as, I, as I'm going through this, if somebody's demanding a bribe from me, what they're telling me for sure is they're not connected to me. Now, will connecting, giving them a solid hit, oxytocin, is this going to turn the situation around? I don't know. But I do know that if I don't bother to find out, my chance of conversion is zero. Right, okay. Uh, I think that makes some sense. I mean, it's like it's, it's one way to go about looking about, uh, dealing with these kind of people because, yeah, they, de- they definitely would have emotions there and that could be something to tell. Yeah, they, 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 you know, the person on the other side of the table, they still got emotions. Now, I'm not saying that get getting, uh, you know, a s- series of really deep five-star that's rights out of them is going to get you out of bribe territory. But I know you're not going to get out of there without it. Fair enough. So, I mean, this is something. It's a tough situation, but this is like tactical empathy and getting that makes at least some kind of a that's right is making some progress with those people. Exactly. Maybe you get a discount on a bribe. I don't know. <laughs> right, whatever. All right, thanks so much, and I appreciate you doing all this. And I love your book and the master class and everything. Thanks. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thanks, Krish. Um, Troy, if you could unmute your... Was this hey, a famous hey. Troy? We get the famous uh, Troy back here? <laughs> Come on. I Troy come. Jackson, I in... the dude I was quoting from yesterday. I love this guy. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Sorry about the background noise. I'm finishing up a walk with one of my companion animals. But um, I hope you guys can hear me clearly. I really apologize. I just really wanted to be here. I got a lot of knowledge, a lot of good um, emotion out of what I heard yesterday. And the same thing's going on right now today. But Chris, I wanted to throw this at you really quick. When you think of like tactical empathy and negotiations, right? And you think of game theory as far as winners and losers, infinite game plan versus finite game plan, right? What's the best strategy? I'm thinking, like, you know, I want this to continue. I don't want to just be a winner or a loser. I don't want winners or losers. Sometimes that may happen, especially like you mentioned, the person is being, I guess you would say, um, not truthful and honest with what they're doing as far as their business or social interactions. So I'm wondering, what's your approach on that? Do I want to keep playing with all these different people or do sometimes I just want to let it go and just win what I win and take my toys and go home? Yeah, you know, uh, I'd, I'd – I hate the term win win, but you know, if you're in if you're in win lose, first of all, you know, that's a finite game and the whole game theory conversation is another interesting conversation because everybody that studied negotiation at one point in time wanted to study game theory. And the academics at Harvard, at MIT, if they put in their course description that they're teaching game theory, like everybody wants I want to know how to win that game. And I have never, ever seen any game theory that actually makes people better negotiators. The only game theory game we ever played, you know, we use the ultimatum game because the human nature reaction to the ultimatum game violates what game theorists, game theorists globally say you should do. And we use the ultimatum game just to prove the game theory doesn't work <laughs> long term, long term success. So and we've gotten really the way our thinking has evolved since the book has come out. And, and it has. I mean, it's kind of cool. It's one of the fun things about continuing to take our courses or learn from each other. You know, I got a I got a core team, the Black Swan team, me and Derek and Brandon are the principal people that are coming up with our ideas and our intellectual property. If you ask a question, Derek, Brandon, and I will each give a different answer and all of us will be right because we think in very complimentary fashions. And then like yesterday, it's the first time I got to hear Sandy talk in a while. And I was literally taking notes. Sandy is coming along. She is, she is bringing some great stuff to the table. And Monday was Troy. Like Troy is one of the most naturals at this that we have ever run across. So, you know, what am I babbling about? We're out of the game theory, win, lose dynamic, and we're into the positive sum game world. 
and what that means and concepts such, such as elf and half. You know, we figure that 80% of the planet is not for us. It's just a mismatch. It's a mismatch in core values. We're very much into the core values and living our core values as a team now and defining those. And if your core values are different than mine, that's no bad on you. You know, I could be a half for you. If you're half for me, I'm probably half for you. And we shouldn't be doing business together because we should be both be going to elves. And while the elves are a minority of the total population, wherever you are, there are more elves out there than you can than you could possibly serve. Like I know in the United States, at least there are three million elves. And we do not have 3 million subscribers to the newsletter. So there are people out there that we're not getting to because we're letting the half slow us down. And your original question is, is it a win-lose world? Is it a game theory world? Or is it a larger positive sum game world? And how do you kick yourself into that positive larger world and some of it is walking away from people you shouldn't be doing business with because they are keeping you from the people that you should have in your life whether you're doing business with them or whether they're in your personal relationships and this is a really hard one to wrap your mind around that you they're better off if you walk away from them probably about five years ago a friend of mine in los angeles michael levine uh, a pr guy came and spoke at the class I was teaching at USC. And I said, Michael, you know, you're a superstar in PR in LA in the entertainment industry. You represented Bill Clinton. I mean, you represented some, some big, big people. What could you tell my students? And one of the first things out of Michael's mouth was fire your flaky friends. And I remember my reaction to that is that's harsh. I mean, you know, Uh, throw people overboard, kick them off to the side, walk away from them. They're your friends. But if they're halves, if they're, if, if, you know, take the word flaky out and just say, you know, we don't match up. Our core values don't match. And I'm holding you back as much as you're holding me back. Then moving on, get you out of the win lose dynamic and into the positive sum game and your life is better. Now, I love your question because you're asking about game theory and you're asking about winning and losing, which means you're studying this. But also from the conversation we had yesterday, you I know you have a high level of emotional intelligence and you're about getting better and having a better life. And these are just some some seeds, some thoughts I'm sharing with you for you to add into your thinking, because if you're about getting better and having a better life, then you got good core values. And that rambling dissertation that was all over the map, I hope it's of some use to you in how you move forward. Oh, uh, not nah, Chris. I'm really like kind of blown away for a lot of different reasons. And one of those is like, you know, you know, like you're, you're very spot on about a lot about me. And I really, really appreciate the encouragement. And, um, you know, this is a, just amazing stuff because it's very natural. It's very humanistic. It makes sense to me. And I love the language when you're using, hey, values and just like, look, why am I putting myself in spaces where I don't belong and just removing myself without causing harm at that point in time? So I really appreciate this. I'm so interested. And thank you for letting me ask the question. I'm on. Yeah, thanks for being with us today, man. Thank you. Thanks, Troy. Um, up next, we have Christian. Christian, could you unmute your mic? Yeah, it's my pleasure to be here. Chris, I love the master class. Big fan. Thanks for your time. Uh, the question Thanks. is, yeah, my pleasure. Uh, the question is interesting. So I've worked with a lot of people in very rural communities, and I've worked with a lot of really, really bright people. And their major problem is they don't spend a lot of time around other folks. They don't feel like they connect. So while they want to be empathetic and they want to be able to interact with people, they simply don't have a great understanding or many commonalities. So how do you bridge that gap? Yeah, well, uh, great question, man. Um, and first of all, 
commonalities are not required for empathy. I mean, tactical empathy is the the next level up. It's a quantum leap forward up from common ground. Because when you're commonalities, when you're looking for commonalities, what you're really hoping for is that someone understands you based on their background. It's a it's a it's an inefficient hypothesis. But let's say if I'm from Iowa and you're from Iowa. Um, I'm hoping you understand where I'm coming from because I'm hoping you grew up in a blue collar environment and in a pitch in with a pitch in attitude and to get things done and figure it out yourself. I'm hoping you understand that. That's what we're hoping from, from common ground. So, but that's, you know, that's, that's a, that's a low percentage proposition. There's a percentage there though. Right. So maybe it's a 25 percent accuracy. It, it beats a zero percent accuracy. So what are the chances if you and I share a common background that you understand where I'm coming from? Well, there is a percentage there. And I, personally, I found that the common ground that's the strongest revolves around your geographic upbringing or your ethnicity. Like if, if you're from a small town in Iowa and I'm from a small town in Iowa, we got a similar geographic uh, experience up to this point in time. You know, if, if you're Irish German and I'm Irish German, we get, if I'm aware of it and if I'm from, if from the Midwest, I'm probably not aware of my ethnic experience. Cause that's the way Midwesterners are. They're kind of colorblind. You know, there's a pretty good chance, uh, that, uh, you might understand what it's like to be completely colorblind because you were Irish German from the Midwest and ethnicity was never discussed in your home. So you're actually completely blind to it. But then empathy doesn't require common ground. It just requires me dialing into you and taking some educated guesses and being willing to be wrong and being educated. Now, you're talking about people in rural areas, and they're attributing their lack of experience to being good at empathy to a lack of practice. And there is that. But their other hidden problem really is their age. What am I talking about? From up to about age 23, 24, 25, despite in addition to the fact that our brain is still developing but everything is awkward like and so we're not thrown by feeling awkward but from about your mid-20s on you start to hit a rhythm and you start to figure think that you know things and you're feeling less and less awkward and then from about the mid-20s on instead of awkwardness going with the territory of being alive feeling awkward throws you off and makes you feel like you're doing something wrong and it becomes the biggest barrier to learning. So the people that you're talking about that are in more isolated areas, they're attributing their feeling of awkwardness to the lack of interaction. But the biggest difference is their age. And we find consistently the feeling of awkwardness is the biggest barrier to learning because adults don't like to feel awkward. And simultaneously, it's also a solid indicator of accelerated learning. Daniel Coyle in his book, The Talent Code, talks about awkwardness being an accelerator for learning. Andrew Huberman, neuroscientist out of Stanford, talks about awkwardness being an indicator of changes in neuroplasticity, which increase your learning. And so the people that you're talking to, to try to get them good at empathy, encourage them to feel awkward. And tell them that when they are trying it and they do feel awkward, they're actually learning much faster. And it's a great sign. And if they're willing to be awkward, it don't matter if they live on the top of a mountain. They're going to learn faster than the guy or gal who's in the middle of a city and they got people around them all the time. But they're running from the feeling of awkwardness as opposed to embracing it. Really well said. So for those folks that are interested, they do feel awkward. Uh, they're looking for practice, but they can't find it. You recommend they watch a TV and try to empathize with a character or something as simple as that? You know, it's not bad. Empathizing with a character, and, you know, there's I think there's some data out there that actually reading helps develop your empathy. So reading great works of fiction where the characters are really well-developed. Now, TV's not bad, 
the real problem with TV is the dialogue in response to empathy is always horrible. Like you see something on TV, you see an actor portraying someone who's troubled or unhappy, and they do a great job of portraying what someone feels like in that situation. And then the dialogue that they write in response to that is always horrible. It's someone talking them into a position, explaining to them, like, I feel the same way you feel. And I hate that when they put that in a TV show, because in real life, if I say I'm in the same boat as you, I feel the same way as you do. In real life, you go F off. And on TV, when somebody says, I feel the same way, the person being spoken to says, oh, thank God. And I'll give you a great example. I'm flying American Airlines a couple weeks ago. I don't know what happened, but they canceled like 25% of the flights across the country. I think they had a pilot problem. They kept real quiet. Pilots didn't show up for work, and they're canceling flights all over the place. Now, I'm supposed to be flying from D.C. to Vegas, and I'm standing in LAX looking for a hotel room. (laughs) I'm in L.A. I don't even plan on being in L.A. I got to find a hotel room. I want American to pay for it because they stranded me in a city I wasn't even supposed to be in at all. And I'm in a line of people in the same boat. And there's a guy up at the front of the line and he is teeing off on this poor girl behind the counter. And so I'm like, let me, let me try this same boat common ground stuff because he's picking on this girl. So I don't use an ounce of empathy with the, I, with this guy, I say to him, Hey man, we're all in the same boat here. I'm stranded too. It's not her fault. Common ground, right? Just like on TV. I know this is not empathy. I'm going for common ground. We're in the same boat, experiencing the same trauma simultaneously. This guy literally turns around and says to me, mind your own effing business. That's how good common ground is. And that's what a difference tactical empathy is. So... If that would have been an episode on TV, he'd have turned around and thanked me for intervening. That's the difference. Great explanation. Thank you. Thanks, Christian. Victoria, you're up next. Hello. Thank you again for having me up, and thank you for hosting these wonderful conversations. I, Chris, I met you yesterday, and I just wanted to first say, Thank you. It was interesting after I spoke with you, just the feeling that you give in your voice, like you're mentoring the person that you're speaking with is, was just really moving. And that really sat with me after we spoke together. Um, oh, thank you. My, my question is, is something that you just said a little while ago, the issues with people who are in the half category and people who are in the L. And just thinking about you have worked with and dealt with some of the most difficult half people in the world. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I'm thinking, of, you know, part of my question yesterday was dealing with the political divide in this country. And I'm wondering if you're, for example, you're in a, you're in a, uh, in a family or in a, your neighbor is a half, but you want to find some way where you have to work together for something that is going to benefit the entire building, let's say, or the entire community. Is there any, given your experience, is it at all possible to, how do, would you try and find a way to half the half, to move, you know, they're not going to be an elf, but you can't have them totally a half. What would you do? What do you do in those situations? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and so it's all right. So what's your best chance of success? And, you know, I used to use that phrase all the time, best chance of success. I learned it. I learned it from, you know, my boss, uh, one of my main mentors, Gary Nessner. He ran ran a crisis negotiation unit when, when I first got there. And Gary used to always talk about best chance of success. And I repeated it over and over and over again. And then finally, we had a kidnapping go bad and people get killed. And I was at the helm and I said to myself, all right, so I guess best chance of success by definition means you're not always going to be successful. So the first thing you got to relieve yourself of is the needing to be always be successful. You know, in baseball, the bat a thousand or 
percentage wise to win 100% of the time. That is not possible. Now, what's my best chance of success? Hostage negotiators got a 93% success rate. 93% success rate. I don't know of any other profession with that high of a percentage success rate. I don't know any salespeople. Wolf of Wall Street in his book, The Way of the Wolf, he talked about having a 3% success rate. Hostage negotiators, tactical empathy, 93% success rate, which by definition means 7% of those people you are never going to get to an agreement with, no matter how much time you put in. So tactical empathy is still the answer, whether they're a neighbor, whether they're on the condo board, whether they're a friend, family member. Expect it to take longer. Let it sink in. What we prescribe and a lot of people when you've got opposing arguments going on, a great way to interact with someone that you disagree with is to say, before I disagree with you, here's what I think your position is. You've done two things. You haven't lured them into thinking in any way, shape, or form that you don't have a counter point of view. Before I disagree, so they know that you're not in agreement, here's what I think your position is. They're going to listen. You're going to get that sentence out. And then they're going to listen intently for where you're coming from. And that's going to start the transformation process. Now, is, is that process going to be sufficient? Even if it's 93% successful, which is a really high rate, 7% of the time it's not going to work. But it's your best chance of success. Tactical empathy is always your best chance of success. Do And let it, do not look for the instantaneous transformation that you will get in, in less adversarial conversations. One of our longtime students, customers, and I talk about this in, the, um, in my TED Talk, He's in an argument with his sister, family member, family gathering. His younger sister is a primary caregiver for their ailing father. And the pressure on her is enormous. She's had too much to drink and she starts in on him. And he said he'd seen this happen before and he realized it was just his turn. And all he wanted to do was make her feel heard and not disagree with anything. Make her feel heard. He said it went on for an hour before she finally ran out of gas. And then she just stopped. She just ran out of gas. Did not have, did not get a that's right out of her. Did not feel the oxytocin moment at all. Just was relieved that she was no longer beating on him. The next day, she sends him an email that said, yesterday I attacked you and you showed me nothing but love. Thank you for being my big brother. Give, him, give it a chance to sink in. Give it a chance to work as much as it possibly can and realize that you've done the best that you can. And it won't always work every time. But without trying it, it won't work at all. That's the best I can give you. <laughs> it, I hope you, you didn't hear all the moments when I'm like, oh, my God, wow. That is just truly beautiful, truly beautiful. And, and, and you could just I could just feel how that can. Because when you focus on really caring for somebody, that is the most beautiful thing you could do. Thank you. I, I really appreciate this. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for being here today. Shay, you going to wrap us up? Yeah, unfortunately, time flies. Um, but I want to thank everyone for all of their questions and for tuning in. Um, be sure to subscribe to the Black Swan Group on YouTube, where we post new videos every week. And follow us on all of our social platforms, which you can find all in my fireside bio. Um, tomorrow, we will be hosting another topic, and that will be the Black Swan Leadership Framework with coach and instructor Derek Gaunt at 12 p.m. Eastern Time. 
And during that session, we'll go over helpful tips to take your leadership skills to the next level and pretty much lead like a hostage negotiator in the business world. Um, so if you're interested, please plan to join us tomorrow and also on Friday for our last fireside conversation of the week. Um, but thank you all for joining and continue to practice your negotiation skills.